Hey, you all, Farmer Jesse here. Got a special, special treat for you today. We are re-releasing the interview I did with Farmer Helen Atow back in early 2020. Some of you may have heard it, some of you may have not. And there are a couple of reasons for re-releasing it. Uh, first is that this one was one of those episodes that we got a ton of positive feedback on. It's just a great episode all the way through. And it's also just one that has really stuck with me. But the main reason that we are reposting this episode is actually very exciting. Helen just released a new book through Chelsea Green called The Ecological Farm, a minimalist, no-till, no-spray, selective weeding, grow-your-own fertilizer system for organic agriculture. It is super excellent and extremely nerdy. And and as the reader, you get to dive even deeper into the details of the systems Helen describes in this conversation that we're posting today. Honestly, I think every serious, ecologically minded grower should own a copy of this new book. Um, so I hope you will pick up a copy and then enjoy this throwback conversation that I had with Helen Atow of Woodleaf Farm. Helen has an amazing story, and we kind of get the full arc in this conversation from her time in Montana at Biodesign Farm, how she studied under Masanobu Fukuoka for a little bit. Uh, and then she had two more farms with her husband, the late, great Carl Rosado, whose work we get to celebrate a little bit here. Um, a lot of Helen's own work is in strip tillage, but she and Carl also did some cool strip no-tillage studies which I was really interested in. Um, it's just an amazing conversation, and I really loved chatting with Helen. Let's get to this amazing interview with Helen Atow of Woodleaf Farm. I'm super excited to have you on. I think some of the systems that you've been using are really interesting, and I'm excited to kind of dive into your work a bit. Um, I thought we could start with you just giving us a sort of brief overview of your farming career. Where did it start? And especially kind of where did your more regenerative practices come into play? You bet. Well, I was lucky enough to uh, grow up in Montana. So I, I uh, learned to farm more conventionally uh, with, uh, with cattle ranchers, actually, in, in western Montana. And then I went off to college and, and um, graduate school and became interested in in horticulture and plant physiology and agricultural ecology and studied uh, studied academically. Uh, and then the best luck was that between my undergraduate and graduate school, I managed to escape. Well, I quit. And for a while, I just went and farmed. And I found a place in Northeast Georgia where they were doing natural farming and ended up, uh, there was a Japanese man that was running the place and using Masanobu Fukuoka's methods. And then several of us uh, over time got to go to Japan and study with Masanobu Fukuoka. So that was probably my starting to get excited about regenerative or alternative or what I like to call ecological agricultural methods. And then I went back and finished graduate school with uh, a lot of excitement and wanted to really focus on organic and ecological agriculture and started working for, well, I worked for the university, but I had clients that were uh, part of our integrated pest management program that wanted to try a little more innovative approaches. And uh, one of the farmers eventually hired me full time to convert his uh, 200 acre, 200, I can't remember exactly how many acres. It was a little over 200 acres of vegetable and fruit crops from uh, uh, an integrated pest management, but conventional. Uh, conventional IPM management to uh, to certified organic in one year, and being young and stupid, I said, "Sure, we can do that, no problem." <laughs> and he was selling. Uh, yeah, that was that was. I learned a lot that year, uh, and he was uh, he was selling in uh, in New York City direct market at all of the farmers markets in New York City, including before it disappeared, the World Trade Center market. So we 
we uh, we went with peaches and apples and uh, all vegetable crops. And uh, boy, uh, we had some great successes, uh, some great learning, and some uh, spectacular failures. And the ones that that were successful are kind of the ones that I ended up building on in my my own career when I finally. Um, moved back to Montana, moved home uh, to where my my parents had land, and I bought a a little farm and started um, the farm that I worked on and did most of my experimenting on uh, called Biodesign Farm. That's a long answer to that question. No, that's a great answer to that question. Uh, I'm interested in hearing a little bit about what it was like to go study with Fukuoka. I think. a lot of people may not realize he just passed away in two, I think it was like 2008, maybe. Um, and that he lived to a ripe old age. He did. I, I, uh, so I, I'm curious, like what it was like to go out there and study with him. Well, I, I had studied for a year, uh, with, um, uh, another Japanese man who had, uh, uh, who had studied with him called Michio Suzuki and I had learned a lot of the techniques and I'd gotten used to, I'm not even sure how to explain it, to the Japanese approach, which is, is a much quieter uh, watch and listen approach. So uh, I, I was not there for very long, but I felt, uh, I, I felt able to watch and, and listen better than, than I, I might have if I just gone straight from, God forbid, straight from uh, college and graduate school where we were focused so much on learning facts. And um, Fukuoka was definitely um, not as uh, focused on facts. And I was always uh, wanting to know how systems worked biologically. And uh, uh, and so I learned to to listen uh, and listen to the land uh, quite quite a bit there. So when you okay, so you're returning back to Montana, and you've just bought this little piece of land. Um, can you describe that land a little bit? Yeah, I bought a a, a farm that had been uh, been in cattle and sheep production for. Many years, it was a, an older place, and uh, it was marginal farmland. It was uh, it was in pasture, uh, and it was not particularly fertile, and it was considered relatively marginal, uh, a low USDA grade soil, and very very rocky. So I uh, I found uh, I started out in the least rocky field and um, did my first tillage and then planted uh, a cover crop of, uh, of white clover. And then I just started modifying what I learned at, at, uh, at Masanobu Fukuoka's and putting in a little of what I had learned in college and graduate school and developed a system that relied on once a year tillage of that, what we call the living mulch. And at that time I was what I call a nitrogen monger. I was a nitrogen farmer and did a lot of calculating and figured out how what I added would, would translate into crop production and how much I needed to replace to, to pull off the, the amount of crop yield that I wanted. So I went back to my, my, more traditional graduate school, agricultural school way of thinking. And, but also with the living mulches and trying to figure out how to have, instead of adding nutrients every year, how I could also get some nutrient cycling going on. So we, uh, we would, uh, do strip tillage, uh, uh, just really lightly, actually, strip tillage is the wrong word. I, I moved to strip tillage. We did a, a light tillage and left a lot of residue uh, on the surface, so much residue that my 
neighbors would go by and say, just when I was about ready to make the beds and plant, they would say, hmm, when are you going to start working your fields up? Because there was so much residue left. And then I would make the raised beds and plant uh, clover seed in the row middles. And that system worked really well. And again, learning to watch and listen, I realized that this living mulch system where the the row middles were clo- or covered with clover from, oh, well, by the time I would seed every year, I would, I would till and then make the beds and then seed the living mulches. And the living mulches would be covered by, by late spring. They would cover the soil. And then I would leave the living mulch on the soil surface until the next spring so that over winter the soil was completely covered. And I learned that that created overwintering sites for some of the resident beneficial insects that then didn't have to move in every year. They were already there. Uh, Spiders, many species of spiders and ground beetles, carotid beetles and rove beetles, and the habitat of the living mulch over the spring and summer and fall also created pollen and nectar and seed sources for above ground beneficial insects like parasitic wasps and and uh, um, uh, predaceous uh, uh, stink beetles and all kinds of fly aphid predators and the ones everyone knows ladybugs and uh, lace wings and uh, uh, my new pirate bugs, we had this huge uh, increase in beneficial insects. And so I had been mowing the living mulch to initiate and encourage nutrient cycling, to, you know, just like leaves will fall into the forest and decompose. My theory was that I would mow the living mulch every time it got to be uh, 10 inches to 12 inches, and then it would slowly go back and decompose and grow again. And that that's how we got it. We got our our added fertilizer, our side dressing, so to speak, of fertilizer by having that mowing. And the other thing, too, that that did is that sometimes, actually pretty regularly in the early years, the first, you know, the first five to eight years, we had a lot of annual weeds growing back up through the clover, and I learned that if I mowed them, the clover liked the mowing, and the annual weeds did not, and over time, I I diminished significantly population of annual weeds, and gosh, you know, after uh, uh, 10 to 12 years, we, we just really didn't see that many annual weeds anymore. So um, we mowed for all those reasons, and we tried to do selective mowing so that we could have climate modification for the crops early in the spring, higher living mulches to keep the, the wind off the young seedlings and the early transplants, and let the living mulch bloom so that it would it would provide habitat for beneficial insects and predators, and then mow it and not mow it all at once. So I started mowing every other row middle and then leaving some habitat for the beneficial insects. And uh, and over time, we just got to the point where we tried to leave certain rows of the living mulch uh, untilled so that we would leave these islands of habitat for beneficial insects. And uh, not till the whole field. So I guess the summary there is that the system started out with uh, just something to put down between the row middles, mainly for nutrient cycling. And then as we watched the system, we realized that we were getting incredible biological control and we were able to stop spraying certified organic insecticide like like soap or, or um, gosh, I can't even remember what we used to spray, um, pyrethrin for, uh, for some of the insects. And, uh, and then we stopped by uh, 2000, we stopped spraying anything at all. The system was 
Uh, we started in 1992, by the way. So by uh, after eight years, we uh, basically stopped spraying any certified organic insecticides and we're getting uh, entirely acceptable yields and excellent quality. So um, after we started leaving the islands of, of uh, beneficial insect habitat, the, the untilled living mulch, mulch uh, rows, Maybe we would leave one row for every 10 rows and and just till around that. We finally got to be brave enough and decided we can do less tillage. And after, uh, let's see, I guess it was 2005, we uh, we started moving and preparing a, another field, a pasture that had been in pasture and, and kind of ignored, not really done much with. I'd gotten a crop of hay off of it every year and grazed horses on it, but I, I hadn't I hadn't done anything else. So in 2005, I tilled that whole field up and planted red clover and triticale, and the field came back almost 100% uh, red clover and just looked like something out of the Wizard of Oz. It was so beautiful and solid and green. And I said, okay, this shows me that we can get away with trying to do no-till row middles and let's see what we can get away with. So in uh, 2006, we just strip-tilled where the beds were going to be with a three-foot tiller. We will strip-till the beds and then mow the living mulch row middles, which were about four foot because that was the size of my of my little uh, my little tractor and mower that could fit in between. And uh, I'd mowed them and threw the clover into the row mid or into the crop rows. and then um, I would put uh, plastic mulch on for the crop that needed a warmer soil, like tomatoes and peppers and eggplants, and uh, and I would just do the one one tillage pass and then put the plastic mulch on, um, and then all of that residue would decompose over the season uh, underneath the plastic uh, and feed the transplants that I put in, the tomatoes and peppers and eggplant transplants. And then the other rows, I would till the uh, clover in that I mowed onto the bed uh, at least one more time. And for small seeded crops like carrots, I would sometimes do a third pass just to make an, a, a fine seed bed for the uh, for the uh, little seeded crops, um, which I never did very well. Uh, I'm, I'm a pretty terrible carrot grower, by the way, so I... I focused on what I did well um, and just grew small amounts of of the challenging crops. Although we did well with seeded lettuces uh, and salad mixes, so maybe it was just the thinning of the carrots that I objected to. I had spent too much time with Masanobu Fukuoka and wasn't very good at uh, at doing our traditional horticulture thinning. So we uh, we moved to this system where we had living mulches that were never tilled, uh, so four foot row middles that were perennial red clover. And as those of you who have worked with red clover know, it uh, it's a perennial and it's a very aggressive perennial. It was great; it just couldn't be better for keeping weed pressure down. We never had any of those annual weed problems in this red clover that we'd had with the white clover early on when I was tilling the field every year and then planting the white clover living mulches. But uh, what we did have is we had the red clover moving back into the into the crop row. And so our, our main weed became our living mulch. <laughs> but we, over time, realized that uh, if we just could suppress the red clover at certain times. By the end of the year, we were kind of glad to have the red clover move back into the row and that it allowed us a living mulch to then strip till in, or a, a, a cover crop, so to speak, to then strip till in the next the next season. And our soil was completely covered because of that lovely 
aggressive rhizomatous red clover. And so that was the system in, uh, I guess, let's see, that was 2006 to uh, 2010. And I sold the farm in 2010 and moved down to uh, California to uh, farm with my husband in, um, in the Sierra foothills of California. That's, that's great. So you basically just kept answering all of the questions that I have <laughs> because, and, and it was, which is great. And it was, it was so interesting. One of, there were so many things that you said there that I really loved. Like um, one about the red clover sort of creeping back into the bed at the end of the season. I think that's super interesting. This idea of like a cover crop that kind of just replants itself. Yes, and and you, you, I, I want to just jump on that point because, of course, in the you know in the first uh, you know in the first twelve years of my farming, I had to, I had a cost of seed, right? I had to to buy new seed and seed it every year in the in what we call the new field. I never had to see it again. Right, right, yeah, that's amazing. So you had four foot pathways essentially which the crop middles, as you called them. Um, and then you had, how wide were the beds? They, they were three foot wide. Is that what you said the tiller was? Right. I had a, I had a little tiller. It was kind of based on my equipment. I had a, a little tiller that was three foot wide and I had a little Yanmar tractor and a little, uh, a rotary mower that were four foot wide. So, so the, the beds were as wide as the tiller and the, the row middles were as high as, as uh, wide as the mower because I, uh, yeah, I managed it all with uh, basically two pieces of equipment. Yeah, that's amazing. So how, okay, a couple more things because I'm thinking about this in Montana. You were able to get, you were able to do this out in the field and have ripe tomatoes, ripe peppers, ripe egg, eggplant, all of those things in Montana. And I'm glad that you're impressed that it isn't saying much, but at the time I was the largest field grown tomato producer in Montana. Again, it wasn't saying much, but most people produce tomatoes in, in greenhouses and high tunnels. But, uh, the reason I think we were able to get away with that, well, there were two. One is that, remember I said, we did use the, the black plastic mulch and, uh, and I felt badly about that because the plastic is obviously an, an unsustainable, unecological approach. Uh, but at that time, I've since figured out another approach. But at that time, I couldn't figure out how to warm the soil and still get a commercial yield. So, yes, uh, we used black plastic. And then we also used, as soon as I uh, planted we would cover uh, the plants with wire uh, hoops and then with um, with a, an Agrabon, uh, a Rime kind of product. And uh, we learned that we could leave the Rime on for three to, to five weeks and that not only did we have frost protection and warmth, but we uh, we learned something at least with our solanaceous crops that we got better root development uh, with the shading that we got this this vegetative uh, and root growth and uh, it was like you know things that grow in the tropics they uh, they they just liked or or the northeast you know how you get that incredible vegetative growth and that. Then when we slowly uh, took the the agribond off, uh, the crops uh, were were much farther along than they would have been uh, if we if we hadn't put the agribond or the reme on. So we we utilized um, um, uh, fabric, and then we utilized the black plastic. And and yes, um, I did try some. Uh, some peppers as I got uh, more brave and had been making enough money that I could make more mistakes. Uh, later on, I tried peppers on raised beds, but without the plastic. And the raised beds slowed the red clover movement back into the bed just a little bit, enough so that we could get some establishment of the red peppers. And the yields were still pretty good on the red peppers, 
but we got red peppers two to three weeks later than we did with the peppers on the, on the black plastic. And some years that was not a huge financial detriment. And some years you made so much money on those first red peppers that uh, it was a, a huge financial hit to, to start production, uh, you know, two to three weeks later. And can you kind of venture a guess as to how much land, because it's kind of hard because so much of it was mowed. Can you, can you say about how much land was in cultivation there? That's a really good question. I mean, I can certainly tell you <laughs> how much acreage was. Um, we had the, the old field was a two acre field and the, uh, the new field was a six acre field. But you'd have to say that um, the the rows were much closer together in in the two acre field. So I'd say uh, I used a, a hand mower, uh, a little BCS push mower, um, because the rows were so close. Um, yeah, they were probably three foot beds and and one to two foot row middles but I'm going to say that we were probably doing an acre and a half of vegetables on the old field. And, you know, we're, you're going to have to say 50% was in clover. So we were probably doing, uh, out of six, we were probably doing three acres of vegetables. Um, when, when we went to the system with the wider living mulches. Uh, but one thing I did want to mention, um, with this method of strip tilling the the overwintering clover and weeds, thank goodness we got weeds too because they were full of nutrients uh, in the crop row, and then mowing the red clover and and tilling that in, we um, we had uh, and then making red raised beds. Of course, we had almost a uh, what would be an, an intensive uh, bed method not i mean obviously not quite we weren't double digging or you know doing any of uh, the jevons techniques or the uh, french intensive biodynamic intent uh, approaches but we were still concentrating nutrients in a three-foot bed so all of that is to say that the the yields were extremely concentrated and very high in those beds which of course didn't make up for uh, uh, entirely. Sometimes it did because the yields were so high, but, but, uh, with those four foot beds, of course, our per acre yield was probably lower than, well, certainly lower than it would have been if we'd done, uh, you know, a field, a more conventional field pattern without leaving the living mulches in between. Um, but not as low as I would have expected because we got, we got over yielding in the concentrated bed, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's neat. So one thing that you mentioned there that I kind of want to just touch on for a second is the weeds and the nutrients. And one of the videos I saw, um, you talked about the ability of mallow to fix nitrogen. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so so mallow doesn't fix nitrogen. It doesn't. Uh, it, it, it's not. Uh, it, it doesn't have that we know of, of course. Uh, but I'm going to say uh, science is pretty good on this. That there's there's not a, a, a rhizobium uh, or a frankia, or there's no bacterial uh, interaction between uh, between mallow and and. Uh, you know, and a nitrogen fixer. So it's not a traditional nitrogen fixer, but what it is is a nitrogen accumulator. And it took me a while to figure this out in the in the old field where, remember, <clears throat> we were tilling every year and then seeding the red clover, So, or excuse me, the white clover. Uh, actually, we tried several things. We did uh, parabanga medic, we did snail medic, we did lentils, we did white clover and yellow sweet clover, uh, all site clover. We tried a whole bunch of things that we seeded because we seeded every year. But 
as I disturb the soil every year and did the same ecological thing every year for a while, I would kill in the spring and then I would, I would seed the clover and then I would mow. I developed weeds that liked that kind of ecological approach. And one of them was mallow, uh, Melva neglecta, common mallow, just really loved <laughs> the same thing that the clover did. It liked, it liked to be low growing and it liked to mow, be mowed. And then over time, as the soil fertility built up, and not only did it build up in the, the first couple of years, but uh, I started in 92, and by 1996, I had excessive levels of nitrate, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, so excessive that I, I had to change my farming system. The nutrient levels were, were too high, and I started seeing such high nitrogen levels. Uh, at one point, uh, my spring nitrate, nitrogen, I think it was in 1996, was uh, 100 parts per million. So I, and I started that year, I started seeing blossom end rot on the tomatoes at a little higher level than I had had previously. And I felt that I was getting antagonism with, uh, between that excessive nitrogen and, and calcium magnesium levels. So I, I, I had to reassess and I, I backed off and stopped, uh, uh, decreased and then stopped altogether applying compost and began to rely more on the living mulch fertility contribution. With the excessive nutrients over time in the old field, we also noticed a change in the, in the vegetation, and we started seeing more weeds, and particularly the weeds that liked the same ecological habitat that the clover liked, which was a mowing and uh, and uh, a tillage once a year, and that common mallow, the Malva neglecta, became very, very dominant. I have pictures of um, Malva neglecta or the common mallow being almost my entire ground cover in certain areas, and of course, my neighbors noticed and would tell me that I was just making a weedy field, and I felt badly. But it wasn't actually getting in my way, and the soil fertility was still really good. So I, I talked to um, a brilliant uh, soil fertility person, Robert Parnes, who wrote the book uh, Fertile Soil, and he sent me some data, uh, which is in one of the later versions of his book, Fertile Soil, on uh, the, the contributions of of weeds, and I looked up, and sure enough, Malva neglect, or actually, he had Malva rotunda folia. He had a different mallow, but a, a cousin of my mallow weed, and it was contributing 80 pounds of nitrogen per acre. And I looked at it, and I said, "My God, this plant is accumulating, and every time I till it, adding back to the soil, and that." was the first germ of an idea that has now been the basis of our entire system on our new farm in Oregon, which is not only are we cycling nutrients as we use cover crops and living mulches, but if we really do it right, we're recycling nutrients. We're using plants and their biomass to accumulate nutrients in the soil. And then as we mow and as we strip till, we're recycling those nutrients back. And this was really important because we, uh, we decided that maybe we could use no off-farm, no on our Oregon farm, we decided that we could use no off-farm fertilizer and only use what we grew on farm. And we moved to a system of totally um, using grow your own fertilizer. But in Montana, I I hadn't I hadn't gotten that brave or creative yet, and we were still learning the lessons that. Fukuoka taught us, which is to watch nature and just barely getting the ideas. But 
that that mallow, that common mallow was the first idea for me that, wow, we could get things that would just accumulate nutrients and then recycle them back to the soil. Yeah, that that's great. I think that we're just now kind of touching the surface of how to really utilize living plants around crops. And I think that's like a really, um, yeah, really beautiful way of, of putting it. Okay, so you moved to Northern California. Can you tell us a little bit about that farm and how you kind of incorporated those new ideas? Yes, I, I met my husband at the Eco Farm Conference. He was presenting his uh, work and his system uh, using living mulches. He had an entirely no-till system in his orchard. I uh, did a little minimum till when he did some vegetable production, and I thought it was brilliant. So I asked all kinds of questions, and the next day he came to my presentation on my living mulch system, and and uh, eventually I sold my farm and moved in to help him with his farm. And we went with the two of us, egging each other on and, and uh, helping each other, we uh, went to even wilder habitat creation. We got to the point where we would only mow selectively and we would let in the spring the, uh, the orchard just go entirely crazy and wild. And we found that the same thing happened even with his orchard system. We were able to, let's see, that was... Uh, I moved in uh, 2011, 2012. Uh, by 2013, uh, we had really decreased. And by 2014, we stopped any uh, organic, certified organic uh, insecticide spray. So we, we were able to uh, create in fields right next to the crop biological control for the terrible cobbling moth, which causes wormy apples, and nobody wants to find a worm in their apple, and uh, a peach pest as well. So we were able to, to basically emulate what occurred at my farm in Montana in a much higher pressure system in California and still get high yields and, and acceptable not entirely 100% clean, but acceptable fruit quality without any spraying, which was extremely exciting to us. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's really neat. Uh, so let me, I guess I should explain that system a little bit. So, um, so Woodley Farm in California was uh, 26 acres and eight acres in tree fruit production. And the fields were one to two acres. There were seven uh, one to two acre fields, and they were separated by uh, native oak and pine forest corridors, so that we had smaller fields separated by by you know by wilder areas, and then the fields themselves were all on the contour on uh, on on slight to, to pretty good slopes, and in between was a. a grass and weed and clover living mulch that was, uh, of course, a perennial living mulch. And Carl, unlike me, was uh, a much braver soil fertility manager, and he didn't feel the need to be a nitrogen monger, and he introduced me to the concept of carbon farming, to focusing on building high carbon in the soil and then allowing the nutrients to be released from your carbon framework, your organic matter framework. And at first, I didn't believe him, but our yields were very good, and we began to experiment more and more with uh, with a high-carbon system. And not only did it ultimately seem to work with the perennial crops, the tree fruit crops, we began to slowly move into uh, a high carbon system with our, our vegetable, our annual crops as well. So what did that look like in practice in terms of like, how did that differ from what you were doing? 
So in Montana, I had made a compost with uh, uh, manure and clover and straw. And of course, manure being the turbojet high nitrogen application for, you know, for annual crops. And on Carl's farm, the only off-farm, well, actually the only nitrogen off-farm fertilization that he applied was uh, was a, a, a yard waste compost, so composted wood bark, branches, and leaves. And so it was a, a much lower nitrogen than the compost and clover and straw compost that I had done. And so we used that uh, a little bit on the orchard and also on the... Uh, on the uh, we used it on the peaches, not on the apples, uh, and we used it on uh, the small areas of the orchard that we would put into vegetable production. And we did very little vegetable production, but we did uh, these wonderful long Asian cucumbers on a trellis, and we did, uh, of course, once I moved there, we did peppers and tomatoes. But uh, in very, we probably had all together on the whole, the whole place in little pockets where you know where old trees came out, and we would do some tillage. We uh, probably had mm, just barely an acre of vegetables. Okay, that's great. At what point did you move up to Oregon then? So we had uh, uh, 2013, 14, and 15. We had uh, just unbelievably bountiful and lucrative years. We had um, excellent yields and excellent quality, and with two of us working the farm and our our labor saving uh, approaches, we didn't have much labor for the farm, so it was just the two of us and one other full time uh, fellow who who worked um, like us really really long hours. So when I say he, he was one full-time person, you know, all of us worked more like 70 to 80 hours a week than, a than, a what some people might consider full-time, but basically just three people running the farm and a little bit of help with uh, fruit packing and some other people helping uh, at farmers markets. We did seven farmers markets in the Bay area per week. With all of those three lucrative years, bountiful years, and very little put costs and very little labor costs, we made so much money, we said, you know, we could probably be close to early retirement here. And especially, I had sold my farm, and if we sell the farm, it would leap. So we went on a, on a backpacking and camping trip and looked for land. And uh, Carl had found a place in eastern Oregon where there was lots of wild space and, and lots of water. And it looks like it was low enough to grow peaches. And when we came into the valley, we were just so entranced by all of this wild fruit growing everywhere along the rivers and the irrigation ditches. There were wild plums and wild apricots and apples. And we said, this is a fruit grower's paradise. So we found a farm uh, at the end of 2015 uh, and, and bought it in December and moved in March 1st, 2016 and started planting a new orchard and put up greenhouses and high tunnels and started a new vegetable field. And uh, we we went from a 26-acre farm to a 211-acre farm for retirement. <laughs> <laughs> but fortunately, most, yeah, that was supposed to be funny. <laughs> and most of it, however, was in, in wild land. But still, there were uh, 70 irrigated acres along a mile of uh, this beautiful creek, Eagle Creek. And it had been in pasture for over 50 years. Uh, but it had been, for the last 15 years, it had been hayed two, two crops a year and uh, grazed uh, only enough to, you know, to use that, utilize the hay that was put up on the place, but uh, not, you know, not 
not I mean, fertility hadn't been maintained except nitrogen phosphorus. They had added, you know, conventional fertilizer, chemical fertilizer to keep the hay yields up. And so while the soil texture and quality and general fertility was good, the the nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium levels were pretty low because they'd been doing just the opposite of what we'd been doing, building up a, a carbon structure, an organic matter system. They were building up, they were just, you know, basically giving chemical fertilizer to get a crop. So um, we had, for our system, low fertility soil, even though it was uh, the most fertile soil that we had ever started with in our farming practices. So we weren't sure what we could get away with, but we we wanted to see if we could utilize all the techniques, the carbon farming techniques that we had had developed and see if we could just grow our own fertilizer and not bring in off-farm fertilizer and if we could go to no-till on the orchard. So the first few trees we put in, we strip tilled just the way I had done in uh, in the later stages of my farming at uh, at Biodesign Farm in Montana. And we just took that 50 year old pasture and we mowed it down, and then we strip tilled with that same three foot tiller, three foot beds for our trees, and we planted them. And then uh, I seeded clover, but to be honest, the the hay moved itself back in, and it was mainly uh, grasses and alfalfa and clover. And I experimented with some beneficial insect and pollinator mixes, but but to be honest, what came naturally in the end seemed to <laughs> to work the best, and which of course gave us the same system of of not having to ever reseed again. So we. Uh, we did that with the first trees that we planted, and then where we were able to prepare ahead of time, we mowed and got uh, hay, or what we called green chop, from our property, and we put it down, oh, I think it was about 30 pounds of green chop or hay on every hole where the tree was going to go the next spring, and then we were able to um, pull that back, and we had uh, uh, set the the pasture, the 50 year old pasture, back enough that we were able to to plant a tree directly into that. So most of the field uh, got strip tilled, and some of it was no no till. Um, about out of 600 trees, about 200 trees were no till, and uh, they're doing great. And the uh, the minimum till trees are are probably the best fruit trees I have ever seen or grown interesting so the I'll, I'll have to send you photographs yeah we had uh, just wonderful yields and quality and again uh, no spraying oh but i do need to add one thing that we did so carl unlike me who was a nitrogen uh, monger uh, carl did uh, mineral balancing and so he had studied with neil kinsey and was a big believer in mineral balancing with micronutrients and with calcium, phosphorus, and magnesium. So he did that in the Woodley Farm in California. When we moved to Oregon, uh, the deal was that I was going to be brave and we were just going to use plant-based high-carbon fertilizer, that I didn't need any turbojet high-nitrogen manure fertilizer, but that he was going to figure out how to use less of the minerals because, of course, the minerals are mined from somebody else's land to then be brought to our land. And I had seen limestones and phosphate mining in in uh, in Idaho and in British Columbia, and I just felt that we needed to be more sustainable than that. And Carl agreed, so we mixed up minerals, and he put them down right underneath that that hay mulch or where we did the the strip tilling just around every every tree hole. So instead of mineralizing the whole field, we just mineralized where the tree was. And then the idea being that 
anything that was not in balance, if we if we did it that one time in that one place, perhaps we could introduce it to the system and we would see if our recycling would work with uh, with the micronutrients and uh, and the phosphorus and magnesium. We already had very high calcium levels in uh, in the soil in the farm in Oregon, so we didn't have to balance that well. But the idea was to see how far we could push the envelope with uh, mineral balancing and mineral recycling, as well as the the big three, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, recycling. And so, so we we did we did that experiment. I love that. Yeah, that's a that's a super, especially in something like an orchard where you don't necessarily need it on every square foot. Um, that makes a lot of sense. Not only can it save you money, but ecologically and just sustainability thinking that's got to be that's got to take some pressure off um i want to hear about this four-year study that you did at this farm uh you sent me this pdf yeah it's really cool are we able can i share that do you mind if i share that with people or is that proprietary yes you're you're very welcome to do that so so the same thing remember we're (laughs) semi-retired on this farm and uh we uh, 600 trees instead of 3,000 trees uh, <laughs> did seem like retirement, but uh, but it wasn't what a lot of people would consider retirement. But we but what was retirement was we got to really push our ideas and see how far we could go because we were not as tied financially to making a living. So we could we could have failures. And uh, I do need to tell you, the first year we planted our our dried beans, we grow, uh, you know, we, we also really like heirloom dried beans, and we thought at one point we would grow that as a crop, uh, but we were certainly growing them for our own, trying to grow all our own food. So we put in uh, black turtle beans and cranberry beans and uh, Floriani red flint corn, and we did the strip tillage, remember, on this low fertility soil, well, high fertility soil, a beautiful deep loam, uh, river bottom soil, for goodness sake, but that had been chem- used as a, it had been chemical fertilizer and not any organic matter. The organic matter uh, was low when we started. It was, uh, it was around 2%, 2.5%. So we did the strip tillage and we didn't add any fertilizer. We said, okay, let's see if we can just add the the tilled in pasture and then use our living mulches and blow it into the the crop. And what we got with the first 2016 um, beans and corn and some of the vegetables is that we got uh, we got nitrogen and phosphorus and mobilization, and we got some kind of yellowy looking crops the first uh, you know the first couple of weeks, and they eventually grew out of it. And the yields on the beans were were good, but not great. And the yield on the corn was pretty meager, uh, pretty you know you would have been if you were trying to make a living on it, it would have been a disaster. And so we looked at that and we said, hmm, maybe just adding the the tilled in field and the living mulch isn't enough. So uh, we started adding green chop, which is the uh, the hay that was uh, that was cut on another part of the farm or close to where we were going to do the vegetable rows, and then put on in the fall let to decompose and then tilled in in the uh, in the spring and by 2017 we had better vegetable yields and and not so much a slow start in the spring but that led us to the experiment and we said well what can we get away with we're trying not to bring in off farm fertilizer and we have the living mulch If we do the strip tillage, we have the living mulch in the row middle blown into the crop row, and we also have our our green chop, our hay from other parts of the farm. Let's set up an experiment comparing both of those. So in the fall or late summer of 
2017, we set up basically two fertilizer treatments to uh, to compare. One where we had uh, ridiculously wide 10 foot row middles and four foot uh, crop rows, and then we would mow the living mulch from either side into the into the crop row, and that would be our fertility. And then the other fertility system, we called it fertility system two, we would put on four inches of hay mulch along with the living mulch mowings and test that against uh, against the living mulch. And so we let uh, we let the hay mulch and the living mulch just sit all winter and tilled them in in the spring of 2018 and uh, started the first year on four rows. We had four long rows with uh, several replications of each treatment in each row. And we had a rotation of uh, one row was cabbage and onions. Uh, The second row was red peppers, red bell peppers. The third row was uh, beans, and the fourth row was supposed to be corn, uh, but that got changed to another, a second row of heirloom beans uh, when Carl had a terrible accident and I had to do the uh, experiment by myself. I just couldn't get it together to to do the the corn, too. So we had a uh, what had been planned to be a four-year rotation with four rows, and uh, uh, the four the four different crops moving uh, to different uh, different rows over the four years, and then the two soil fertility systems would be in permanent plots, of course, in each of the rows. So that was the basic design, and the first year I was only able to collect data on the. Uh, the black beans and the cranberry beans, the heirloom dry beans, and there wasn't much difference, although there was a little higher yield in the the plots with the extra four inches of hay mulch added and tilled in in the spring. And then the second year in 2019, again, not too much difference uh, among the dry beans, and the red cabbage, which I'll have to send you. Oh, maybe you have photographs. Yeah. Um, the photographs, the yield from 2019, the cabbage was just gorgeous. Uh, and again, not too much difference between the the two soil fertility systems, the mulch, the living mulch only and the living mulch plus added hay mulch. But the red peppers had a huge difference, huge difference, almost double the yield of red bell peppers in the plots that received the extra four inches. So, so far into this experiment, it uh, it looks like some crops, some of the heavy cedar crops need that extra added mulch, and some of them can get away with uh, several mowings a year into the into the crop row of of just the living mulch as long as you provide enough area so that you have enough volume to keep mowing into into the crop. And Carl did some calculations. Uh, we you know we tested what the nutrient content of the the living mulch and the the hay mulch or the the green shop was. And we also then got the dried material and weighed it up and calculated how much we were adding. And I'm I'm not entirely comfortable with those numbers yet, but on uh, where we had those those wide rows, the 15 foot of row middle, Carl calculated that we were probably adding about 400 pounds, uh, if you did it that way, you would get, uh, and you extrapolate it out, you get about 400 pounds per acre. So about two tons of hay added per acre. And again, I'm not real comfortable with those numbers, uh, 
but but I think the numbers are are higher than I would have thought, and so two tons per acre doesn't doesn't seem entirely unreasonable if you have enough area and you're mowing it regularly throughout the season. And then, of course, the other benefits of the the system we found in this experiment was not just nutrient cycling and recycling, but also we had the same uh, habitat for beneficial insects. We tried to do selective mowing and leave things flowering as much as we could. And um, and then the undisturbed uh, no-till area where we had habitat for spiders and and uh, uh, ground beetles. And in Oregon, we found out we also had habitat for lots of snakes, um, all of which were beneficial to our our crops, um, and some of which made me a little nervous. But I'm learning to go back to what Masanobu Fukuoka said, which was. Farming is an unconditional effort to keep all things alive and growing. And so all things, even the snakes, got to be alive and growing. <laughs> <laughs> right. And, yeah, and um, and then the other thing, just by kind of accident, we realize, is when we applied a lot of the, the living mulch mowed into the into the row and Carl fashioned our little Husqvarna mower so that it was easier to blow all of it into the crop row that we had, you know, a little bit of hay mulch that also helped us with, uh, with weed management. So the good news is that uh, because uh, Carl uh, was injured and unable to help farm uh, for a year and a half, that I ran uh, basically uh, three quarters of an acre of vegetables uh, with 10 300-foot rows of vegetables uh, entirely by myself with no other labor at all, which um, really showed me that in some ways it's, it's not how much you yield overall, but how much how much you end up getting back so it's the uh it's the input costs as well if you can really limit your input costs then your uh your productivity is measured in a in a, an entirely different way i guess is what i'm trying to say yeah that's great so if you were to going to kind of design like Let's just take a step back and and we talked about that whole try that that whole study. So from the very beginning, you start a garden and then you what are like the first steps to get it to that point that it's so manageable, like you said, with one person. Yeah, yeah, I think that's an excellent question, and I think it's going to depend, of course, on your climate and your your conditions, your your water availability, your soil type, uh, your soil fertility that you're moving into, uh, whether or not you have uh, uh, recalcitrant weed problems that you go into, um, just all of the environmental conditions that are going to impact the the ability of that crop to grow well and the ability of that crop to overcome competition and what the competition is. So as all ecologists start any answer to any question, it depends. And so, right. so with, with that caveat, with that caveat, I'll, I'll just tell you what the systems that, that I have been involved with, um, uh, on Carl's system, it was it was uh, uh, a really terrible soil, uh, wooded, uh, mostly wooded, and wooded that had been cut and was in grazed meadow and not a very strong meadow. And that took a lot of of off farm uh, compost to build up the soil and a lot of water to grow the living mulches to then keep a living root in the soil at all times and to have have residue added regularly. So with that kind of soil, he really needed the off-farm inputs 
to get to a place where we could then significantly reduce the off-farm inputs, which we, we did. And then at my farm, I started with low fertility pasture, and I, I, I could have probably done closer to what we did in Oregon, but I still think I would have needed to add maybe not compost to the whole field, but compost in the rows, in the crop rows. And then if you have what we had in Oregon, which was a basically high fertility mineral soil with good texture, good water, and uh, a good, a relatively good climate that we could, we could then really push the envelope and, and do the system that I just, just uh, basically told you about. And that was, of course, to look at the pasture and say, okay, the soil fertility and this is pretty good. The soil organic matter is pretty good, but, but low. So we're going to add residues to build it up. We're going to take time. If you have a year to plan, that's wonderful. You can do almost anything. If you need to start making a living immediately, then you need to add some off-farm fertilizer. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. And when you're saying off-farm fertilizers, you're talking about composts and those sorts of things? Right. So at Woodleaf Farm in California, it was the composted yard waste compost, um, which was uh, which was a wonderful uh, thing that was available in California because there were rules uh, and regulations that all yard waste needed to be composted. It couldn't be thrown away. And so there was readily available cheap yard waste compost. Uh, where I was in Montana, there were a lot of livestock producers, and so I could collect manure, and I could bring it onto the farm, mix it with my my materials, and and make compost. So whatever whatever is readily available to you for a compost to you know to add uh, to do two things to build up your soil organic matter and your your carbon skeleton in the soil and to feed your soil food web to get them going and active because in this kind of high residue farming, you can't do it without a healthy soil microbial community. So um, so you move to a place, you've got mainly pasture, you do a soil test, you find out what the soil fertility is, you look at the depth and texture and quality of your soil, you figure out what your irrigation system is, and then you decide, number one question, how can I disturb the soil as little as possible? How can I design a system that keeps a growing root in the soil year round? And so what I did and what Carl did was to have these living mulch row middles. And that way, even if my crops were annuals and, and that we used tillage to incorporate weeds in the crop and uh, some of the living mulch fertilizer, that some of that field had a growing root in the soil year round. So those are my two big caveats there. Well, and I'm going to add a third. So disturb the soil as little as possible for your climate, your soil conditions, and your financial situation, what kind of market you have and what kind of yield you need to be able to make a living at that market and be able to stay on the land. And then keep a growing root in the soil year-round and create habitat for beneficial insects as close to your crop as possible. We have, uh, my husband and I actually came up with what we consider our 10 ecological principles, but those are the first three that I think are the most vital for then designing a system and going with it. And so that is how we did our system with uh, strip tilling into the 50-year-old pasture and adding living mulch from both sides of the row. And that's why we had the wider rows. We also had the 15-foot wide rows because our plan was to do uh, a 15-year 
rotation with five years in in one tilled bed and then move over one five foot section and then seed that that area that we've been tilling to clover and by then what what we notice that happens is when you crop when you really crop an area you utilize the nutrients and the clovers will grow really well but when you build the soil up what happens, I forgot to mention at my system in biodesign in Montana, was that over time, I built the soil up by mowing the living mulches and leaving it in place and blowing it into the row nettles, that the, the nitrogen levels and the phosphorus, but particularly nitrogen levels, went up and the clover was no longer competitive with the grasses. So my beautiful field of solid clover by 2011 in Montana was a solid grass field. So those li- those perennial living mulches had turned totally to grass. And that actually wasn't such a bad thing if you're becoming a carbon farmer. But over time, I think what we would have done is seed the crop row back to a clover and then do strip tillage after, say, seven or eight years to the row middles and, and trade back and forth, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. I'm, I'm wondering, you said that you've given us like three of your seven ecological uh, principles. Can you give us what those, or three of your 10, can you give us what the other seven are? I could if I had my computer up and running, which I don't, but what I would do would be glad, I would be glad to um, email you the 10. Uh, I, I mean, I could come up with them off the top of my head, but I have them written out so beautifully. We, whenever we get presentations, we, we present them and we've worded them so well, uh, I, I think that I'd love to email them to you. And because I'm also getting to be an old lady and I don't remember things as well as I used to. No, that's great. If, if you've got them well worded, I'm not going to put you on the spot to do it. You can send those. If you want to send them, we'll, we'll, we'll put them up and, and let people see that. Beautiful. I will, I will email them to you, Jesse. Well, Helen, this has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for your time. Well, thank you for inviting me to, to talk about this and to, and giving me your thoughts and asking me your questions. Whenever people come and look at our systems or ask me questions, it helps me to to see things in a different way and always helps me to understand things better. So I really appreciate that. I have one other thing to add. I'm, uh, I'm in a position now that I don't know what the future of my farm is. And I am looking for people that might want to uh, come and learn and help me on the farm. I have, uh, as I said, a a ridiculously huge amount of acreage and lots of equipment. And I have shown myself that I can run it by myself. Uh, But the yields on the orchards as the trees are getting bigger and bigger are, are going to increase. And it's going to get harder to do myself, doing all the harvesting myself. And we have a, a beautiful um, guest house where we were had planned on teaching courses and having students come to uh, stay on the farm for five day periods and and uh, do both a kind of an academic and hands on classes. And because I my husband never recovered from this accident and I've lost him, <laughs> I need some help. <laughs> so. If anybody is really interested in this kind of a system and wants to talk to me about it, I'd love to talk to them. Yeah, that would be great. And we would we would be happy to advertise that for you. And um, it would be, I think, an honor for a lot of people to get that, that opportunity to work with you. So yeah, we'll, we'll definitely put that out there. Well, that would be super, Jesse. I sure appreciate it. Absolutely. And all of our condolences. Um, on, on your loss and, um, you know, super honored that you're sharing all of this and, um, and, um, it's, it's great to hear it. And thank you for, for taking the time. Well, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate it. You know, I, I love this new farm. We designed this orchard to, uh, 
to be everything that we, you know, had ever wanted to. Some of the, the peach crosses we made and we collected apricot seed from all over the, the valley and our farm where all the wild apricots were growing and planted them out. So we have this 300 foot uh, row of wild apricots and we want to see, you know, if these will be her, more hardy and sturdy than than the cultivated apricots that, that we've always grown. And we have this, this 600 tree orchard with 85 varieties and I really would like to stay and taste all 85 of those new varieties and all the apricots that we we collected and all the peach crosses. And so I hate to leave, but uh, but I think that unless I get some enthusiastic uh, people to help me and 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 be be available on the place as well, I think uh, I think I may have to go farm somewhere else rather than take on this huge place by myself. <laughs> oh yeah. We would, we would hate to see that happen because now I want to taste those peaches and, and pears and, and, and uh, <laughs> so we got to We got to keep it going because I've got to, I've got to get out there and try them. If you enjoyed that episode, make sure to follow Helen's work at woodleaffarm.org. We will also post that study that she spoke about uh, at no till this week. Thank you all for listening. We'll see you next week. 